If you thought the annual CES gathering in Las Vegas was just about gadgets, you would be gravely mistaken. It's also about meeting basic human needs. Dr. Cody Friesen is the Fulton Engineering Professor of Innovation at Arizona State University and the founder and CEO of Zero Mass Water, which builds hydro panels producing water from sunlight and air. It's been said that all the water in the world is already here. I asked Dr. Friesen, from his perspective, is that true? Well, in a literal sense, in the sense that we live on this little marble swinging around the sun, and all the water that we'll ever have on this planet is here. Uh, The really interesting thing about water is that the overwhelming majority, over 99% of it is salt water. And then just a small part of that is water that we refer to as fresh water. But that is only really saying fresh because it doesn't have salt in it. A lot of water in the ground, on the surface, and so on has been, uh, let's say, modified by uh, sort of uh, human industrial behavior. And so we've gone from a history where uh, water that was in the ground or flowing on the surface was largely clean to a condition where it's getting ever harder to make sure that it's good for human consumption. We're constantly reminded of how many people on the planet don't have water so that any of these ways that are very innovative now that we can ensure a good water supply is good. And that's what we're talking about here. Now, tell us what this product does, and then we'll talk about how it all works together. We're talking about products called Source, and it's a hydro panel. What's that? Yeah, the idea there behind uh, Source is to take sunlight and air and produce drinking water and do that totally independent of infrastructure. So no wire going in and no pipe going in, just one pipe leading out. Remembering that water is H2O. That's right. And if you if you think about uh, the human condition and, and when we think about how much bottled water is consumed globally, about a half a trillion liters a year. And that's not for wealthy people – Uh, majority is not for wealthy people who are looking for a convenience. 95% of bottled water consumption is a rational choice by people who need to do so in order to avoid getting sick. And that's both in the U.S. and all around the globe. And so if you look at that as the incumbent, which Pacific Institute and Cal Recycle, when they did their analyses around the carbon footprint of bottled water, it's about one kilogram of CO2 per liter a bottled water. So that's about a one-to-one weight ratio. That's crazy. And so if we go from that to a solution that almost digitizes water in the sense that in the same way that your cell phone allows you to have all of humanity's information in your pocket or a solar panel allows you to own your own electricity, source enables you to have complete independence around your water. Okay. So how does it work? We're at CES in Las Vegas. You know, you're just producing water out of air and sunlight. So, you know, you're going to have to be a little more specific. So there's actually a lot of um, experiences in your personal life that allow you to sort of understand in a very straightforward way what source does. Um, If you ever lift the lid off of a sugar bowl, you'll see that the sugar sort of clumps a bit, right? Or in your favorite greasy spoon restaurant, you'll see the little rice kernels inside of a salt shaker. Well, the sugar is clumping and the rice is in that salt shaker because – they're what's referred to as hygroscopic. That's the big word that means is Greek hygro, which means water vapor, and scopic meaning it likes it, right? So uh, sugar is highly hygroscopic. It likes water vapor. It turns out that you can engineer materials to have that property and to take up water very, very quickly. I'm speaking with Arizona State Professor Dr. Cody Friesen, the founder and CEO of Zero Mass Water. We'll talk more. After a break, you are listening to Tech Nation. I've been speaking with Arizona State University professor Cody Friesen, the founder and CEO of Zero Mass Water, about how materials can be engineered to absorb water, just like sugar or salt. That's one of the things we did is to develop nanostructured, hierarchically porous materials that can take up water from the atmosphere, concentrate it from the air by about 20,000 times by volume. And then we use a solar technology and thermodynamics to then drive a cycle where we take water from the air and then we produce water 
in liquid form, just like much like the uh, sun coming up over the oceans, evaporating the water from the ocean, forming clouds, and then it raining back down. We do that every hour of every day, almost anywhere on the planet. And then gravity takes hold, and it just drops to the bottom. Yeah, we we put that into a reservoir. Every single panel, um, it has a 30-liter reservoir inside, and then has a pump that pumps it to your tap at 80 PSI. So the person inside the home or in the school or any other place that we might be, their experience is much like the municipal supply. You open the what would have been your filter tap or go to your refrigerator, and the water arrives at pressure and has the same composition and taste as some of the top bottled water brands in the world. Uh, in fact, we did a big analysis, uh, elemental analysis of a bunch of different bottled water brands to really understand what was in them that made them good and also found some of the stuff that was in them that isn't so good. Uh, so we have this really crazy library of all this stuff, but it allowed us to then go engineer our water to have a mouthfeel and taste that sort of is right at that luxury water experience that we can take to whether it's Puerto Rico or somebody living in San Francisco or somebody uh, uh, who's a Syrian refugee in northern Lebanon. It's so a really big range. We're very, very proud of our water in San Francisco because we drink snow melt uh, hundreds of miles away oh, yes, the in the Hetch great the Hetch Hetchy <laughs> Valley. We, we dammed it up, S- snows every winter, and it melts, and then we transport it literally across the state of California. We open our tap in San Francisco, and it's just pure water. It's delicious. It's absolutely great. That's overkill <laughs> to, the, to the nth, nth, nth degree considering that we could create water locally. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the thing that's really neat or interesting is um, the famed Hetch Hetchy results. It is amazing water. One of the things, though, that you that uh, people don't always appreciate is that the infrastructure is still pretty old in San Francisco. And so even just recently, you know, in, uh, I think it was about November in Oakland, a bunch of schools are found to have greater than EPA limits of lead. That's not because of the water that was coming from the lake far away. That was because of the infrastructure. Right. And it's one of the three big problems with water, right? It's broken infrastructure, lack of transparency around what you're consuming, and lack of convenience, having to put in filters or buy bottles. And with source, it, it just comes from the air, and there's zero supply chain. It's right there, made at your home. And uh, it's renewable water that uh, is there whether the sun is shining or not because we store it. So we have something like a battery, but in this form of the reservoir. Now, you would put these solar panels, these hydro panels, excuse me, on your roof or the roof of your building if there were multiple units in the building. And uh, so it would depend on how much sunlight there is. Does it also depend on how humid the air is? Somewhat, uh, but it's actually less dependent on that than you might think initially. Uh, So we are based in Scottsdale, Arizona, which is a very dry, sunny place. Uh, And it's because of the way that we uh, actually make the water. Your intuition is right because you're probably used to, you know, that cold glass of iced tea and dew forming on the outside. But we don't actually make water by direct condensation that way. We have these materials that absorb water no matter what the relative humidity is. And then we just have to apply the thermodynamics that allow us to cycle that water out of those materials. And so as long as there's some humidity, which almost anywhere on the planet there is, and as long as there's some sunlight, which most of the time there is, uh, we can produce water. Now, what if it snows? I mean, on the East Coast right now at this recording, it's freezing, it's snowing. I mean, it's really a tough, harsh winter. Would it be able to operate there? When everything's frozen, right, even the water inside of our panels gets frozen. And so uh, when we have a seasonal condition like that, what we'll do is we'll put in an array That is a little bit bigger. And then you're basically doing seasonal energy storage in the form of water. And so somebody who's in Vermont or upstate New York, uh, instead of having two panels on their home that you might have in California, might have three panels and then store so that in the winter there's a reservoir. A larger reservoir. Yeah, yeah, it's a separate reservoir inside the home that allows people to have their great perfected water any time of the year. How big are these panels? So they're – about the size of a, of a sheet of plywood, if you want to think about it. So it's sort of a typical solar panel size. Uh, and in a typical U.S. residence, we would put in two panels, which gives you up to 
10 liters of water a day or about 20 standard bottles a day of water, which is like a case of bottled water a day. So it's enough for a typical family for all their drinking and cooking needs. Now, depending on where you live, will it, the amount it produced change? So we've actually done modeling for of environment and sol- solar and so on for all over the globe. And so we have a really good understanding of how much you'll make on a month-by-month basis pretty much anywhere on the planet. And so we size arrays based on that. So when we're at a school in uh, Sinaloa, Mexico, where we're at several schools there, uh, for a, let's say a 100-child school, the number of panels there might be different than the array that we put in in North Carolina or then the, that's a school that we put at uh, in northern Lebanon. So those we adjust based on that just like you would for a normal solar installation. Now, what have you learned doing these installations all over the world? Well, getting you all the way back to the human element, uh, one of the things that I just pinch myself every day is – getting to take this technology that started as material science and then applying good mechanical engineers, good chemical engineers, computational fluid dynamicists, and all of this technology that all these technologists had had to come around to make source possible. Then now when we put these in, uh, people and children that didn't have good access to water before and people in the U.S. who have broken infrastructure or whatever it might be, all of a sudden they're owning their own water. They have independence around their water. And that can, that can be really life-changing for people. So the thing that I've learned is just how awesome it is to take something that is really one of humanity's greatest problems and translate a technology into that space and change people's lives one at a time. It's been awesome. So for me, it's um, re-energized my love of innovation and technology development. Now, did you have an idea that you wanted to work on water, or is it more that you observed something and started to apply it? How did it happen? Yeah, it's one of those things where the universe kind of wanted to make it happen, you know? <laughs> so it's this confluence of things. Nudging you in a direction, All right? Yeah, no, I think, you know, so uh, I've spent a lot of time in the emerging markets over the years um, and gotten to know people across the economic spectrum. And whether we're talking about, you know, Southeast Asia or Central America, or you know the deserts of the U.S. Um, or the Arabian deserts, water stress is sort of a human condition. There are places where there are meters and meters of rainfall per year, but nothing to drink. And then there are places where there's water scarcity driving water stress. And sort of recognizing that and sort of starting to look at how people individually solve that problem across the whole economic spectrum, it started, it became clear that if one could create enough drinking water for, you know, a family independent of infrastructure, you could change the world. The interesting kind of uh, juxtaposition, if you will, is if you just take a breath of air, do it with me here, Moira, right? All you have to do to own the air you breathe is just take a breath and water and air are the equivalent for your life. And yet think about the supply chain of the air that you just breathed and the supply chain of the last drink of water you had. Think about how different those things are. If we could collapse the the second into a supply chain that's similar to the air you breathe, the world changes dramatically. Now, you've already said, hey, each panel is about the size of a of a sheet of plywood, which is roughly say four by eight, something like that. Um, how thick is the panel? It's uh, the panel top is about four inches, and then there's a um, box underneath that basically is where the reservoir is, and so on. Okay. And, and how much does this weigh without the water in it? <laughs> uh, about 130 kilograms. And what's that in pounds for oh. our American friends? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, about 275 pounds. There you go. <laughs> and okay, so we're talking, boy, that's that's pretty big. That's a lot on your roof, you know. From a footprint perspective, it's it's spread out, so it's not more density of weight to, than like an air conditioner. So when we typically do an installation, the, the roof structures are almost always uh, strong enough to support the weight. And, of course, we do engineering to make sure that's the case. So the weight per area is not that much more than a typical solar array or air conditioner. Now, in electronics, I'd say, okay, better, faster, cheaper. That we'd have to say smaller footprint, weighs less. You know, had any ideas? Yeah, we have a, a really uh, phenomenal R&D team. 
that is constantly working on all sorts of things. Uh, we have, uh, you know, a world uh, defining or sorry, a category defining technology here that, you know, really is is the world's first uh, hydro panel. When we think about where we go from here, there's all sorts of really cool stuff coming down the pipe. And you've got all those students. You're still a professor. That's right. You never and know what's going to come out of Young people come minds. up with the best ideas. There you go. Hey, uh, Cody, thank you so much. You're always welcome on Tech Nation. Come back anytime. Thank you, Moira. Arizona State Engineering Professor Cody Friesen is the founder and CEO of Zero Mass Water. More information is available at zeromasswater.com.